color and white and blue. It's time for Veterans Issues, the show that brings you information about veterans, military, and their families. Now here's your host, Ken Rollins. Welcome to Veterans Issues. Ken Rollins here, and uh, today is another spotlight on a veteran today, and I've got Danny Thornton on here. He's Lieutenant Colonel Retired. He's from up in Gadsden, Elwell County, and he's going to talk to you about his uh, service, highlight some of the things he's done, uh, give you a perspective on what it's like to be in the military, and then come out and, and be in the civilian world. We'll be right back. We'll be right back with Danny. Stay where you are. Get you up in. Welcome back in to Veterans Issues. Ken Rollins here, and today we we're talking with a veteran. He's a veteran of so many branches. We'll go and get into all that in just a minute. I can't say Army or Air Force, whatever. It's all of them. So uh, let's uh, show you, say hello to uh, Danny Thornton, Lieutenant Colonel retired. Welcome Thank to you. I'm gonna call you, you Colonel. Ken. I'm gonna call you Danny. You do that. All right, Danny. Danny is. Uh, Danny, I've uh, met for some time back. I was up at. Uh, Moya up in, you invited me up to speak to the yes. Military Officers Association up in Gadsden and met a lot of folks up there that I knew. I didn't, you just a small world in it. Mm -hmm. You had a lot of, a lot of people in that organization that are, um, some of them are old retired politicians and whatever, it's a, it's a mixture. It is. And I got to meet Senator Phil Williams while I was up there. I hadn't seen him in a while, so. Yes. Thank you for, again for inviting me up to You're that. You're very welcome. And uh, I don't, I wasn't, I, I didn't know you don't have such great food or I wouldn't have ate on the way up there, but I, I sat there, I did eat the dessert. But anyhow, uh, Danny, you um, you served in several branches of service, and I'll get in that in just a minute, but are you from local, or are you from here? I'm from here, born in Aniston. Born in Aniston, all yes, that? Yes, I was. Okay. And then sometime you, was you drafted, joined, or what, what happened on you? I actually joined, I, after I turned 18, uh, joined the Marine Corps, uh, January 1970. Was you out of your mind? I must have been. <laughs> you go across that island, that bridge. Yeah, the go, bridge of no return. That's it. Uh, to hear so many people, including my brother, that uh, that's, that's like uh, they closing the jail cell behind you, you know, when you go over that's that. That's true. That, uh, so you went in the Marine Corps. Uh, let's just say 1970, is that what you said? 1970. Okay. Well, the Vietnam War was a uh, few, few years from being over with, like uh, 75, so you had five more years of that. Did you? Yes. And you served at uh, some of the places you served in the Marine Corps. Uh, I went to uh, communication school in uh, Panama, in, not Panama City, but in uh, Pensacola, uh, Corey Field, the Naval Communications Training Center. And when I left there, my first posting overseas was to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. I stayed there for a year. And what did you do at Guantanamo? I worked at the, I was initially worked at the, uh, it was called the Naval Security Group Detachment. And after I got there, the Marine Corps pulled Company L of Marine Support Battalion out of Da Nang in Vietnam and re assigned them to Guantanamo Bay. So I ended up in the Company L Marine Support Battalion. Well, we know of Guantanamo, we call it Gitmo now. That's yep. the prison for the for the terrorists. So you wasn't involved, not, I mean, they didn't have that then, I know, because. That was way before, Way yeah. before that, but did they have a prison there at the time that uh, active as well? None that I was aware yeah. of. The only, uh, occasionally you would get uh, people who would defect over the fence from Cuba oh, gotcha. into Guantanamo. Uh, we heard about those things. I never witnessed one personally, but we heard that those that, that happened occasionally. Then you, um, after you served there at uh, Guantanamo, you went, where else did you go? There's exotic places. <laughs> well, when I left there, I went to exotic Okinawa, Camp Courtney, it was uh, headquarters, 3rd Marine Division. Camp Courtney. Okinawa. Is that, I went to uh, Naha, and um, that, you know where that is. I mm -hmm. mean, that's where a ship landed, went yes. on there a couple of days, and I, that's, uh, but what was you doing in Okinawa? Was that the same thing, communication thing? I was doing communications. I worked in the G2 intelligence section of uh, headquarters, 3rd Marine Division, as a yeah. communications operator. For the people out there that's watching that's not, they're lay people, they don't understand. We're talking about communications, you know, we got telephones, iPhones, and all these things, but 
someone that just a general description of something you do is just you get information, relay information. What is, what is that the better description? Well, f in the department that I worked in, in intelligence was mostly handling intelligence information coming from uh, various locations around the world, a lot of it from Vietnam, and we're, we would get teletype messages is what it was at the time, uh, yeah. old teletypes, and those would be compiled for briefing the uh, the general, the commander the of the Marine Division. Centcom down in Florida, so I guess just some of the stuff y'all go to, go to Centcom, you know, where the, uh, they d d spread out to all the people concerned, or just go to. Uh, I, I guess I'm getting, you know, you get a teletype from a commander in Vietnam saying, mm -hmm. "We face an enemy," and so on and so forth. Is that the kind of stuff you're doing. Uh, uh, it would be so some of that, yes, and and a lot of it would be something would be indecipherable to us, it would be electronic intelligence like uh, uh, radar data or uh, uh, information that was intercepted over radios. And, okay. But it would go into, from us and go to, mostly went back to the director of National Security Agency. Probably give them some idea of where the radar detections were and stuff like that. That's the kind of stuff that we dealt with a lot. Yeah. Then. Uh, after you went to Okinawa, I saw on your bio thing, you was discharged uh, in 72, I believe it was. December of 72, I got out of the Marines, came back here to Anniston, and What'd you do then? met my future wife, and got married in January 1973, started family, and- What kind of work was you doing? Anything I could at the time. <laughs> Legal. <laughs> I got, uh, I went to work at Anniston Army Depot in July of 1973, uh, a laborer, and uh, started going to college about the same time. Started going to college on my GI Bill in about 73, about June of 73, and went to Gadsden State uh, for a couple years, and then ended up going to uh, uh, Jacksonville State and finished my uh, bachelor's degree requirements at Jacksonville State in 1978. Yeah. They uh, thank God for Anderson Army Depot, but would they have a, a veteran's hiring preference back in that day? They did, as a matter of fact, and uh, it, it was, uh, I, in fact, I was hired on a veteran's preference, I believe, in, in 1973. They were hi hiring a lot of the guys that were coming back out of the service at that time because there, were, there was really a lot of them at that yeah. time. I went. I was hired in '82, and I went under the Veterans Preference Program with, with a little assistance from a congressman, Bill Nichols, that was here. He was, he would help you in a heartbeat, and uh, he helped me get on out there. And that, I think, and you said you started as a laborer. I started as a steam cleaner. Well, I mean, one of the hardest jobs, mm -hmm. hot in the summer and Absolutely. freeze you in the winter, and uh, but I earned my stripes, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it was good to me. I loved, retired after 32 years with a depot and my military, but uh, thank God for it. That, uh, when, uh, well, I want to get into some of the other things. What I'm doing is trying to show that people served in active duty in the military and then they come out and the things that they walked. And we're going to be facing a lot of that here with our folks coming home we sure from, are. from Afghanistan. So we got to go to a break. We're going to stay right there and we're going to come back with more. But Danny, in just a minute, stay where you are, get your pen. Be right back. Welcome back to Veterans Issue. We're talking with Danny Thornton, and we're talking about his military and what he did after he got out of the military. And he's got out so many times. He was in the Marine Corps, and uh, then you got out. Uh, and um, when you you enlisted in, the, I'm looking here, Alabama National Guard. That's the United States Army. Yes. In 1974, as a combat engineer, and so you went from the Marine Corps to the Army. Yes. Okay. And. What, what was that all about, just to further your career? Or? Well, really, I missed the, I missed the military, you know, missed that, still having that. You still during that I time. did, yeah, yeah, I did. I missed the military, missed the companionship and camaraderie, mm -hmm. all those sorts of things. And, and besides, you know, it, it was a paycheck, yeah. an, another paycheck, so I needed the money, so that was one way to do that. And uh, so I joined the, uh, Alabama National Guard in uh, Jacksonville. It was a uh, combat engineers. Well, that's uh, scary days for me because I, 
I was in the engineer construction, uh, and we were talking offsite about how I would wreck the low boy and all these kind of things. But the combat engineers over in Vietnam, they were <clears throat> one of their responsibilities was blowing up tunnels, you know, and that kind of thing. That, yes. Of course, they had to they had to log everything that was in there. You know, if they found ammo or they found food, they had to write it down and give it to MACV headquarters. And you could learn so much about the enemy of what was in those tunnels. Sure. And so the, I was assigned to a combat engineer detachment for a period of time. And it was very interesting to see how they do that. And they, they told how they could tell how bad off the enemy was or how they, and they had a lot of Kellogg's cornflakes under them in them tunnels. <laughs> Sun-kissed orange juice too. But, but anyhow, you was in the uh, National Guard just for a year, though. I mean, you, you just a little over a year. I, in March of 1975, I, I had a friend that I worked with at the depot who asked that I would come visit them at the uh, Air National Guard unit that was in Gasden, and I did that. And they were a communications unit. And communications is what I did in the Marine Corps, something I was familiar with and I would like to get back into. So I ended up joining that unit. And is uh, that Army, is that the Air National Guard, is that the Air Force or is that Army? Air Force. So now you went from the Marines to the Army to the Air Force. Yes, changed okay. uniforms again. I got you. <laughs> I, I think about that because I serve with a lot of people that had served in other branches of service. and. They brought a lot of that with them, and we'd have to tell them, "You're not in the Navy anymore," or, right. you know. And and if we were in engineers and had somebody that had been to artillery, shine their boots every day, we had to remind them, "You're in the engineers now. We don't worry right. about shine boots." <laughs> well, they tell you, you know, when once you're a Marine, you're always a Marine. Yeah. So that never leaves you. Yeah. And I've told people before that I think I learned everything I ever needed to know about leadership my, the first two weeks that I was at Paris Island. Yeah. That was, that was something that was very confusing to me as uh, uh, I went at 17 and um, they got in my face and told me, it was Army, but it wasn't Air Force, uh, Marine Corps, got in my face and told me how low I was, how, what a scumbag I was, how, how the lowest form of human mankind I was. Yes. Then to tell me to be proud of who I am, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the proud of you. But, Anyhow, you listed in the, uh, uh, let's see, I'm gonna get ahead of myself, in the Air National Guard, and uh, then you went, you went full-time then, but you're still working at the depot. You're still doing both of the. I worked at the depot until 1981, March of 1981. Yeah. I left there and took a full-time position with the Air National Guard on, yeah. on active duty. It was a, a Title 32, which is a state position, but it was active duty, enlisted and I was working as the uh, superintendent of communications. Are you still in the communications arena yes. when you're doing that? Okay. That was, um, and then at some point there you went, with these others, the highest rank you held was what, Spec 5, Special 5? I was a Spec a 5 corporal. when I got out of the uh, Army National Guard. I was a corporal when I got out of the Marine Corps. Okay. And I served, enlisted in the Air National Guard. I was a senior master sergeant when I was discharged. Uh, to get my commission, I was an E-8 Senior Master Sergeant. So then you got a commission for a second lieutenant? So yes. That, okay, that's that's where I want to pick up there. That, uh, And you went to, if I'm reading this right, you went to the Virgin Islands? Yes. Well, you had the rough duty. I did. That was that was uh, one of the roughest ones right how'd there. You si how did you survive it? <laughs> <laughs> It was it wasn't easy because I was separated from my family. Oh, okay. So yeah. you know, my, my family was still in in the Gasden area, and so it was like a remote tour for me. Now, of course, they would come and visit, and I would come back here and visit. But uh, for the most part, it was like a remote tour for that four-year period of time. Well, you said you got a family. I know you got a wife, but you got children up there. Yes, I have I two mean, children. They got names. Michael and Shannon. Hey Mike, and Shannon. hey, Mike and Shannon. Michael's yeah. a lawyer and Shannon's a nurse right down here in Oxford at the uh, surgery center. Wow, that's great. You got to be proud, man. Um, but you was, let's see, you went to the Virgin Islands. You went to, uh, this is one that you got me with the Tyndall Air Force Base. And, and there's so many positions you held on there. But I want to get over to something that, uh, go to 
fast forward to 2011, September the 11th. You was with Nor. Uh, you had some dealing with NORAD. Yeah, I was the North assigned. North American. Was that was that North American? Air defense. Air defense. Okay. Yeah, I got you. That covers the whole world. <laughs> right. Yeah, I was assigned to uh, headquarters, First Air Force at Tyndall Air Force Base, and. First Air Force operational side is the CONUS NORAD region. In CONUS other words, for you folks out of the continental United States. Continental United States NORAD region, yeah. which our responsibility was the contiguous 48 states uh, for air defense and air sovereignty. I want everybody that's hearing that word NORAD to remember back September the 11th when we were all scared to death. We had no idea what was going on. NORAD was recovering and tracking. We're still trying to figure out where the enemy was. And you saw that screen over the United States with all those blips of those planes just wiped out. There was no planes in the air. Absolutely. And I remember it like it happened yesterday. Just to see the skies over the United States completely blank, except for a, a fighter jet or something every once in a while. Yes. Uh, you, you were in on that. We were. We were, in fact, we were in the middle of a, or about the fourth day of a NORAD exercise. We were working uh, called Vigilant Guardian, and uh, we were working that. Uh, I was working the night shift. My boss was the day shift, uh, the A6, which is the communications officer in the Air Operations Center. I got off work the morning of September 11th and briefed my relief, went home, went to bed. I hadn't been asleep just a few minutes, I guess, and the phone rang, woke me up, and uh, it was my boss calling me from uh, the Air Operations Center. He said, hey, you need to uh, get up, take a look what's going on, and try to get some rest, because we're probably not going to get any rest for a while. And I got up and looked at the television and could see what was happening. and. Uh, was really shocked, you know, and I could forget about going back to sleep. I couldn't go back to sleep, but uh, uh, it was quite an experience, that 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 whole... Uh, yeah. Well, I, I told you yesterday, we was talking, and I said, uh, everybody has something to relate to. I, I remember, that was September 11th, and the next month, I don't remember, it was like mid-October or something, we were in Florida or Gulf Shores or something, and out on the patio, we heard a noise and it was an aircraft. It was so unique. Here's a plane, actually it was a, it was a United or American Airlines and we've seen the first aircraft flying in, mm -hmm. in a month nearly so. But we've, uh, and, and it was, that's the day we got to remember, we can't get complacent, forget no. that because it's, man, we have run out of time. I've enjoyed the heck out of it. Danny, I appreciate you coming on here. It just shows how people, the different things that people do to protect this country and thank you for your well, service. Well, thank you for having me, Ken. I right. appreciate it. Appreciate it. we got to go to a break. We'll take a pause for the calls and come back. i got news that you can use. Stay where you are. Get a pen. Be right back. Welcome back in. I appreciate Danny Thornton coming and doing the show today. And uh, we got some news you can use. I want you to have that pen now because I want you to write down this new phone number. This is my new contact number. And if the control room put it down, it's 256 239 Nine two three four, two five six two three nine nine two three four. I'd like to take that out, take that other number out, and uh, put that in there because if you'd like, if you'd like to email me, uh, or you can text me on that number also. But if you would like to email me, and these are all lowercase letters. It's K R R O L L one two three four at AOL dot com, and the next week I'll have that have that ready. For Two three two five six two three nine nine two three four. Now that's the number you get to get in touch with me. And uh, the uh, I talk to you every week about the uh, automobile program. We have one nationwide, but in this area, it's not we're not doing too well in it. We, if there, there's people out there that need transportation, and a lot of families have an extra car that they have got for sale or whatever. We have a uh, way that we can give you through our not-for-profit organization. We can give you a receipt for that automobile, and we can give put that car in the hands of a grandmother who needs to go to the hospital to visit their kids or what grandkids, whatever. And this is something that uh, 
is beneficial to a lot of people in the community. We'll make sure that you get your, for your tax credit, you'll get that. So call that 239-9234 or text me at that number and uh, we'll take care of that, uh, doing the paperwork, get you covered. I want to thank everybody that's been buying this uh, law enforcement tag. That, that tag goes with every color vehicle you got and it also helps us build the law enforcement memorial for the state of Alabama and it gives a small percentage goes to the law enforcement memorial in Washington, D.C. So when you go to renew your tag, to get a new tag, look, ask them to show you the uh, law enforcement tag. And I'm going to tell you something about that. When somebody in law enforcement comes up behind you and sees that law enforcement tag, they're going to be pretty impressed. I just saw one the other day going down to Montgomery, and it, it is an awesome-looking tag, and it does benefit those that's fallen in the line of duty. So... Uh, keep that in mind. I want to thank Steve Hurst, Kale Brown, and Randy Wood for sponsoring Veterans Moments on here. That's a means that we bring you the things that uh, bills that's been passed in the legislature. And without that, there's no way you would know about these bills. So uh, appreciate Randy, Kale, and Steve for doing that. And that's your uh, legislature at work for you. And they they uh, paid for the uh, advertising on that and for that. But thank them so much. And um, if you'd like to see veterans' issues, or you, let's say you're not in an area that covers it, but you want your friends to see it, go to WEAC TV 24 on demand veterans' issues, and you pull up all the shows, and uh, others can watch it and learn things from the show. And you might see somebody on you recognize. Uh, can't forget the uh, Chihau Animal Humane Shelter, Regional Humane Shelter out there. They need. Um, they need blankets and things like that. You can help them out on 256-241-3647. 256-241-3647. Great organization doing great stuff. And we'll have some of them on here in the next few weeks. Uh, HMR is still hiring. Somebody asked me about that uh, yesterday. Is HMR still hiring down in Bell City at the at Colonel Robert L. Howard Veterans Home? Yes, they are. And I don't know what positions they are, but you go on the website and uh, we show it here on the screen and uh, go on that website and look on the career button and you see what they got down there. We got it. This week's shout out is always to go to Betty Carr down there, my buddy down in Aniston and uh, to Bella and Caitlin. And this salute goes to all my fellow uh, veterans and uh, Danny is still here and he'll join me in the salute. We'll see you next week here on Veterans Issues.